right, so welcome to the first official meeting of the St. Jude Society. Uh, this is the presentation that I had planned for last month, but uh, due to the hurricane, I'm doing it this month. So let's start with an opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. I pray you, noble Yesu, that as you have graciously granted me joyfully to imbibe the words of your knowledge, so you will also of your bounty grant me to come at length to yourself, the fount of all wisdom, and to dwell in your presence forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Uh, first, an introduction. My name is Jay Herndon. Um, I am not a historian, a theologian, a linguist, nor am I an expert. All opinions tonight are mine and mine alone. <clears throat> also, just a reminder, since we will be going to the pub afterwards, let's keep all language and subject matter Catholic. Uh, also, I need you. I don't have comment cards, but I do need ideas for venues, topics, advertising, uh, especially speakers. I have two speakers lined up, Mr. Sid for next month and possibly another guy um, for December. Would, is anybody going to not be able to make it if we do one in December or November. Is that a bad time? I mean, I'm not going to do it on Thanksgiving. Yeah, as long as it's not. Yeah. Okay. And also, uh, I don't think this applies to anybody here, but register your email address so I can send you the invites. A gentle reminder to go to Mass. If you do not have a church, I might suggest Annunciation downtown next to Minute Maid Park. In the mornings at the 8 a.m. Mass, there's a Tridentine Mass, and also uh, more reverent Novus Ordo Masses. Go to confession. You cannot save the church if you cannot save yourself. And pray the rosary. It's been my um, New Year's resolution to pray the rosary every day, and I see myself in increments getting better all the time. Uh, some references from Bede himself, The Ecclesiastical History of the English People. Uh, also another book I used for this was by John Marston, The Illustrated Bede, and lots of videos from a professor named Ted Sherman. I don't think he's a Catholic or anything. He has a lot of interesting videos on English literature online. And in fact, I'm just going to straight up plagiarize some of his videos. So part one, I have this designed for three parts, uh, but I don't think that we'll have time to go through all three today. In fact, I know we won't, and I would feel rushed if I tried to get through all three. So I don't want to do that. We're going to go through parts one and two, and I'm going to save the third part, which is a very interesting story on the uh, conversion of King St. Edwin of Northumbria. It's, uh, like I said, it's very interesting, and I don't want to just rush through it. But let's get started. St. Who? St. Bede, I don't think, I would think not 99% of Catholics know who in the world St. Bede is. So who is he? He was born around the year 673 in Wearmouth, Jarrow, North Umbria. I think they might pronounce that Yarrow. I'm not sure. Uh, it's in the modern day town of Sunderland in northern England, which is very close to the Scottish border. He was born on the monastery grounds, probably to noble parents. Uh, why do we think that he was born to noble parents? Because he entered the monastery at age seven. Uh, we don't know if it was in order to become a priest or for just his general education, but if you weren't nobility back then, at age seven, you'd probably be doing some kind of chores in the fields uh, and not going to school. Luckily for us, this monastery contained probably the best library in all of Britain at the time. And how many books would you gather to think that it had? A whopping 200 books. Um, he also never traveled any farther than the town of York, which is approximately 80 miles to the south. He was ordained priest at age 30, which I believe at that time was actually uh, quite young. But as he says, 
While I have observed the regular discipline, my chief delight has always been in study, teaching, and writing. He writes tons of histories, hagiographies, which are lives of the saints, uh, commentaries on the Bible, homilies, hymns, poems, geographies, scientific treatises, and letters. And that picture there is one of the monasteries he was at, St. Paul's in Nero, uh, which was first built around the time of his birth. And those ruins there, we can thank King Henry VIII for those. The Yarrow Dedication Stone is still visible today. Actually, you can, in my poor Latin, I can still, Dedication, Basilica, St. Paul, there's a date there, uh, and it has the name Chilfrid. Uh, in 686, a plague is going to wipe through the monastery, leaving only Chilfrid and probably B. As the only two survivors, and he's still a young boy. He doesn't say that it's him, but he does mention that only a priest and a young boy, which we knew he lived at the monastery, so it must be him. And Chael Fred is Bede's uh, tutor and mentor and abbot. Oh, sorry. The death of Bede, he dies on Ascension Day. 26th of May, 735, approximately 62 years old, he dies reciting the glory be. Uh, some of his legacy is Bede's death song, which are also reputed to be his last words, and I'll read them to you now. Before setting forth on that in inevitable journey, none is wiser than the man who considers before his soul departs hence what good or evil he has done, and what judgment his soul will receive after its passing. He leaves us lots of translations of scriptures into the Old English language. St. Cuthbert writes of him, It seems right to me that the whole race of the English in all provinces, wherever they are, wherever they are found, should give thanks to God that he granted to them so wonderful a man in their nation. His most important work is the work we're going to talk about tonight, the Historia Ecclesiastica Gentis Angelorum. And that picture right there is Bede's tomb. That is not the original uh, location. Again, thanks to Henry VIII, it is now located in Durham Cathedral, uh, which unfortunately is the Church, of the Church of England Cathedral at the moment, but we'll have to do something about that in the future. Uh, sadly, that church has fallen in such dire straits. I've heard that they are uh, viewing Harry Potter movies in the cathedral now. Generation. Like I said, the original shrine was destroyed during the English, quote, Reformation. Uh, in the 1800s, His Holiness Pope Leo XIII declares him a doctor of the church. He's the only Englishman to earn that title. He's also the only Englishman mentioned in Dante's Paradise. He's the patron of English. I made the cardinal rule not turning off my uh, He's the patron of English writers and historians. His feast day is May 25th. Why not the day of his death? Because that's our ascension day. Part two: the ecclesiastical history of the English people. Like I said, this is the most important of these works. He finished it in 731. It is, contains five books covering 800 years. And when we're talking book about books, it really means more chapters because it all fits in about 300 pages here. Uh, it is not only an ecclesiastical work. We wouldn't know much of anything about early Anglo-Saxon Britain without it. It is the first attempt at written history of England. Bede is the first person to speak of the English people and of the English language. Uh, before that, you had English and Saxon and Jewish, uh, but over time, they eventually merged into one language, and he's the first one to call it English. English does not exist on the continent of Europe. This is also the birth of English literature, although it is written in Latin. Why is it written in Latin? 
because at the time, Old English was a very immature language. Uh, there wasn't any standardization. You could go from one village to the next and hear a completely different dialect with completely different ways of spelling things. And it's not until Alfred the Great, a few hundred years later, that you're going that he's going to make an attempt to standardize English. Uh, B did not create the use of BC and AD, but he is, for all sakes, uh, for all purposes, he's the one that made it the standard. Uh, he's the first one to use it in history, um, in telling history. Before that, you had to say something like, in the fifth year of the reign of the Emperor Augustus, and then they would have some other kind of cycle thing, and you would have to know who the emperor was before him and who it was after him to kind of get a rough estimate of what the date is. With BC and AD, there's no, there's no uh, uh, dispute. Everything before the year one, before Christ, goes backwards, and everything from that point onwards goes forwards. Uh, it was written of him, in an age when little was attempted beyond the registration of fact, he had reached the conception of history. Uh, meaning he's not just writing down, in this year we saw 20 Viking ships. Uh, in this year, you know, there was a plague. No, he's utilizing interviews, witnesses, research, and firsthand uh, accounts. Uh, he's, some people call him the father of modern history. This is all remarkable because he basically, like we said, never left the monastery grounds. And great timing for us, if he had been born 50 years uh, previous, he would have been subject to the attacks of the uh, pagan king Penda. And if he had been born 50 years later, he would have been subject to the pagan Vikings. So where does Bede start? He starts with the Roman invasion of Britain. Year 55 BC, Julius Caesar invades Britain. Why? Because it's there. Uh, he put specifically, he needs oaks for his Roman galleys. He doesn't stay long. He has to leave to put down revolts in Gaul. And of course, in 44 BC, uh, old Julius gets assassinated. It's not until about eight years later when Emperor Claudius will invade Britain again, and this time, he completely annexes it and subdues the Britons, the native peoples of Britain. Um, Hadrian builds a wall to keep out the Picts in AD 122. This is one fact that Bede gets wrong in his history. Uh, he attributes it to the Emperor Severus and gives it a date at about 60 years later. Severus actually just expanded the wall that Hadrian had built. Some of the stones from Hadrian's Wall will be used to build the monasteries where B lives at Roma Yarrow. Uh, an important fact is uh, uh, Brittany receives Christianity very early. Uh, there is a tradition of Joseph of Ar Arimathea uh, landing in Britain. B doesn't speak of this. We do know that in AD 156, the British King Lucius writes to Pope, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this, a Lutheris, asking to be converted. And we know for a fact that in the 4th century, England had its first martyr, or Britain at the time, had its first martyr, St. Alvin. Um, this is a nice mosaic that was discovered at some Roman baths. It's dated to probably the 3rd century in Dorset, England. Uh, this is proof that Christianity had been established in Britain for quite some time. Why? Because if they had the money to do this, they had organization. If they were organized, they had been there for a while. Uh, heresy reaches the British Isles. Uh, Bede speaks of Arianism. Uh, it does not take hold, but as Bede says, every sort of pestilential heresy at once poured into the island. Um, if you don't know about Arianism or Arius, its quote-unquote founder, he was an Egyptian. Uh, his beliefs that there was a time before the Son of God where only the Father existed. Uh, I think they uh, 
questioned the divinity of Christ or they considered it lesser than the Father. Uh, this is completely contrary to John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, this was struck down at the Council of Nicaea in AD 325. Uh, there's also a popular story about St. Nicholas uh, striking or slapping Arius at that council for his heresy. Uh, most of his books were burned. We have none that ex exist. So it's all piecemeal information uh, from there. But in, a, in about 100 years, we're going to get Pelagianism in Britain. Pelagius is a Briton, not an Anglo-Saxon, a Briton. Uh, and this spreads like wildfire. Uh, Pelagius, he trivialized the effects of original sin. He said people can be good without God. Uh, I kind of consider this akin to the modern version of I'm spiritual but not religious, or I don't believe in organized religion. Um, it is said that he came up with his beliefs after a visit to Rome and saw all the bad things going on there, just like Luther did. Uh, Pelagianism is going to be the forerunner to the Celtic versus Roman Easter controversy. This is a big thing for Bede. I'm not going to go into much of this tonight because he wrote, he actually wrote an entire book on this. Um, but suffice to say, the Irish monks were keeping different dating systems for Easter as opposed to the Roman uh, dating system. And it was a big ordeal back then. Uh, he does give us a quote from Prosper the Rhetorician. Against the great Augustine, see him crawl, this wretched scribbler with his pen of gall. In what black caverns was this snakeling bread that from the dirt presumes to rear its head? Its food is grain that wave-washed Britain yields or the rank pasture of Campanian fields. And I think we all know what's rank in those pastures. In 410, the Romans have to go. They leave Britannia because the Visigoths are having a big party in Rome. Sorry. Uh, but what has happened to the Britons, the native Celtic peoples of Britannia, in roughly 400 years of Roman rule? They become pacified. They intermarry with the Romans. Um, they're comfortable. They don't have to defend themselves because they have the Romans there to do it for them. And when the Romans leave, as Ross Perot would have said, there was a great sucking sound, a power vacuum. And what is nature of poor? A vacuum. The Picts, who live in what we consider modern-day Scotland, and the Scots, who live in modern-day Ireland, decide to invade the Britons. Uh, the pacified Britons are unable to defend themselves, and B tells us they are given to drunkenness and infighting. Just as a side note, I don't know what this is supposed to be. Uh, the Picts, who were a proto-Celtic people, uh, Pict somehow means painted people. They painted themselves blue. They fought naked in battle. Uh, William Wallace, a lowland Scot, would not have painted himself blue, and he would not, he would not have been killed. Uh, they were also known for their blood-curdling scream that they would let out in battle. I don't, I haven't done any research on this, but just kind of my own uh, thoughts. Uh, the American South, having been uh, colonized by mostly uh, Scotch-Irish people, whose ancestors would have lived in Scotland and probably dealt with the Picts maybe picked up on that, and maybe, my belief is maybe that's the uh, origins of the rebel yell. Bede's view of the native Britons, he says, he uses these exact, exact words, they are weak, stupid, and cowardly. Uh, in regards to Pelagianism, he says they're ready to listen to anything novel and never hold firmly to anything. He blames them for refusing to spread the faith to the Anglo-Saxons, and that any havoc that befalls them is God's punishment for them. Uh, 
Uh, they might have had good ex uh, a good excuse to not spread the faith to the Anglo-Saxons, mostly because they were getting uh, their butts handed to them by the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, the Romans, to their credit, do come back on from time to time to assist the Britons in defending themselves against the Picts and the Scots. Uh, but by AD 46, Rome has Attila to deal with, and they have to completely sever ties. They don't come back after this point. In AD 449, Vortigern, who is possibly a half Briton, half Roman, possibly a mythological figure, he seeks help. He seeks help from the Germans uh, against the Picts and the Scots. Why the Germans? Well, the Germans had never conquered, or excuse me, the Romans never conquered Germania. And the Roman policy was, if you can't beat them, buy them. Uh, Vortigern, with his Roman ties, he knows the reputations of the Germans as mercenaries. Uh, and they, the Germans, so what Vortigern had done was offer them a small portion of Britain if they would come help uh, defend them. So Germanic warriors led by the brothers Hengist and Horsa quickly defeat the Picts. They are possibly also mythological figures. Think Romulus and Remus from Roman mythology. Um, it's a common story throughout Indo-European legend of the divine brothers uh, or the divine twins. Bede doesn't think so, and I'm not saying that he's right or wrong. Uh, Bede says that Horsa is buried in Kent, can't be buried if he didn't exist. Uh, after the Germans defeat the Picts, uh, Borgen says, thanks guys, you can go now. The Germans say, no, nope, I think we're going to stay. They send word back to Germany that the Britons are, quote, cowardly. But let the fun begin. A trickle of German warriors now turns into a tidal wave. And they basically set up a mafia-style protection rack racket where they say, hey, Britons, you pay us, we'll defend you from the pigs. If you don't pay us, we'll side with the pigs to invade you. Uh, this is the tidal wave here. Uh, the angles is this red line here. Uh, they, they, come, they hail from northern Germany, which is today called England. Uh, the lands in, in England, such as East Anglia, derive their name from the angles. The Saxons are from, believe it or not, Saxony in northwest Germany, and they settle further south. The areas of, of England known as West, Wessex, Sussex, Middlesex, uh, Essex, they all take their names from West Saxons, South Saxons, Middle Saxons, East Saxons. The Jutes hail from what is modern day Denmark on the Jutland Peninsula. They small, they colonized a relatively small area, the land of my father's people, or his ancestors, uh, Kent. This is where Canterbury is. Uh, we don't know much about them. We do know that the old English word for jute is the same as giant, but there's no archaeological evidence to show that they were especially tall. Uh, there's also a theory that Frisians from uh, northern Holland and northwestern Germany also came to England. There is no archaeological evidence for this, but B does talk about Frisian merchants in London, and there are, it's hard to see, but there are towns, Brisington, uh, Brighton, that seem to have derived their names from uh, Frisians. Uh, modern Frisian is the closest language to modern English, but I, I've listened to it and I can't make out what they're saying. I met a Dutchman once and I asked him. What, what's the deal with the Frisians? And he told me the best he could compare to in America were Cajuns, where they kind of have their own culture and their own language and everybody else can get lost. The modern politically correct version is that this was not an invasion at all, but a migration. The Germans were simply looking for better weather and a new way of life. Because when I think of Great weather, I think of England. Uh, 
the only evidence of migration over an invasion is the lack of archaeology. We have vital sites between Britons and Picts, uh, between Romans and Britons. We don't have battle sites between the Anglo-Saxons and the Britons. But the Arthurian legends do talk about battles. Uh, we just don't know where they took place. And if, if you can see on this map, which was obviously made by a Welshman, uh, this is the Britain part of England. The pigs, Irish immigrants, the Scots, the Irish, illegal German immigrants known as the English, and this little tiny island off the coast was legal German immigrants what was uh, offered to Hengist and Horsa. This is an invasion in every sense of the word. What's the evidence? Bede writing roughly 300 years afterwards says it was. Within 150 years, uh, what was known as Britain is now England and is completely Anglo-Saxon. The Britons flee to Wales, right here, Cornwall, and to the northwest coast of France, which is called Brittany. The knee is diminutive, means little Britain. For evidence, the word Wales comes from the word Wahalas, which means place of the exiles. If you were mixing with the people that were migrating, I'm uh, pretty sure you wouldn't be called an exile or a foreigner. And also, Welsh, as in to Welsh on a bet, is a pejorative, meaning an oath breaker. More evidence of this being an invasion is that it was uh, that Britain had been Christian, as we said, since possibly the second century. But now that the Anglo Saxons are there, it is now completely pagan. There is also a merging of the angle of the language of the Angles and the Saxons, but not of the Celtic language of the Britons. Also, some DNA evidence. Uh, this is a map of where the Anglo-Saxons uh, finally you know, took over. And the blue is Britain, or the Celtic peoples. And this matches up with DNA evidence taken from today. Uh, if I recall correctly, this DNA evidence was taken from uh, people whose ancestors had lived in the area for at least the past 200 years. And you can see all this red marking uh, pretty much lines up with the red in that. And there's actually more genetic variation between the Celtic peoples than there are between the uh, Angles and the Saxons. More DNA evidence <clears throat> was right on here. Germany, Denmark, Norway, England. The Celtic peoples, Brittany, Wales, Ireland, Scotland. Also something, this is my own personal thought. The Welsh flag, what did the Welsh use as their national symbol? A dragon. Who's the patron saint of England? St. George. And what's he killing? A dragon. We're going to rush through this real quick. Uh, in AD 596, Pope Gregory sends Augustine of Canterbury, who is not Augustine of Canterbury yet, but he sends him to convert the Anglo-Saxons. There's actually a great story, which I won't have time to go into, about Pope Gregory and the English people. Augustine gets into France. He starts hearing about the brutality of the Anglo-Saxons and writes back to Gregory trying to chicken out, trying to back out of it. But Gregory uh, prods him forward. Within roughly a century, all of England is Catholic. Uh, in the early, mid, early to mid 600s, the pagan king Penda and the Celtic Britain king Cadwalla are going to go on a killing spree Then we go to the Synod of Whitby, and this is going back to the Roman versus Irish Easter controversy. Uh, like I said, Bede wrote an entire book on this called De Tempore Ratione. Um, this, sin this Synod uh, establishes that we should follow the Roman Easter and not the Irish but there are still going to be holdouts well into the 700s. Uh, there is also a controversy over the tonsure. This is the Roman tonsure with the back of the head balded. This, this hairline symbolizing 
the crown of thorns. We don't know exactly what the Irish tonsure looked like, but it possibly looked like this. Um, I also call it the full head of face mullet, uh, which is basically just the front of the head balded and the rest left to grow long. It possibly also might have looked something like a uh, per perpendicular mohawk um, from this side of that with the front and the back balded. Uh, some more tidbits. Bede mentions the Saracen invasion of Gaul. Uh, he also holds women in high regard. This is St. Hilda. She is the abbess of this monastery at Whitby. She holds a lot of power, uh, which you, I guess, wouldn't expect a woman to at the time. Uh, there's also a great story about Cadman's Hymn, who learns how to sing in Old English. Um, also, something Protestants love to talk about as well. When we're talking about Catholic back then, it should be lowercase and not capital. B makes no doubt about it. He's talking about the Roman Catholic Church. He talks about the uh, uh, supremacy of the Bishop of Rome over all the Eastern churches as well. Uh, there's also countless stories of saints, miracles, visions, and battles, which we just won't have time to go into. And that's where I'm going to conclude it because this is a great story and I don't want to have to cut it short. Um, and that's all I got, folks. Um, any questions? So what time period did he describe? In, in his book? No, it's not. Well, he starts with the Roman invasion of Britain, which is in uh, 44 B.C. So we're in 79 to 44 B.C. Right. All the way up till approximately his death because he wouldn't have known what, like, so King Alfred the Great, the Vikings, they're not there yet. We, you know, he doesn't write about that. So that's why I titled it The Early History. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you should post it on the Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have the books if, if anybody wants to just wish it to me. But um, I guess that's it, unless anybody has any more questions. The, so the monk haircut that we're all familiar with? The tonsure. Is for... Yes. And I think the Irish tonsure was trying to symbolize it too, um, but because it wasn't a full crown, it only went from one side of the head to the other. Um, back then, people took that kind of stuff very seriously. So. He what? He depressed it. Suppressed it, yeah. Yeah, thanks, because I, I was wondering when that kind of fell out of fashion. Was it something that all priests would have had? All seminarians. Okay. Okay, so... So, so does the FSSP traditional traditional orders that are associated with the UCC is your So it's only while you're a seminarian? Is that <clears throat> it's just that's the moment you can Well that's actually the origin of the Primus, the little hat that bishops and bishops all wear and priests wear as part uh, as part of the cloak of the priests technically. <laughs> uh, but so I've seen plenty of pictures of F FSSP priests and SSPX priests that don't have the tonsure. Oh, I just meant the technical order. Okay. All right. We're getting off into an yeah. area that I'm not knowledgeable of. So. Yeah, I, I actually saw a YouTube video of um, some Brazilian. They weren't seminarians. I guess they had taken a vow to be a religious for a year or so, and they lived amongst the poor and all that. And they all, every single one of them, had the tonsure. Did you see that whole
So in the early medieval times, every priest would have had a tonsure? Don't you need to wear the tonsure all the time? Uh, keep it spongy. It wasn't just a style for the problem. Yeah, is that you good? Yeah. Everybody ready to go eat? Yeah. Right. From going forward.